Good afternoon and welcome to Washington National Cathedral. My name's Randy Hollerith and I'm the Dean of the Cathedral. And on behalf of Mary Ann Buddy, the Bishop of the Diocese of Washington and all of us here at the Cathedral, thank you for joining us for this Honest to God conversation. Uh, we are so glad that we are able to have with us this afternoon um, Bishop Yvette uh, Flunder and um, her gifts. She was a wonderful preacher this morning for us and a great blessing to have her here. This cathedral is a house of prayer for all people and it's committed to being a source of hope and reconciliation and healing in our nation. Bringing people together for important conversations is a priority for the cathedral. As an institution that sits on one of the highest pieces of property in our nation's capital, the National Cathedral seeks to be a bridge between the sacred and the civic in our society. Our programmatic focus this spring is on leadership, specifically discussing what good leadership looks like. And for Christians, that is leadership as exemplified by Jesus, what we call in the church servant leadership. What an honor it is for me to be in conversation this afternoon with one of the most inspiring and innovative leaders of the 21st century, the Reverend Dr. Yvette Flunder. Bishop Flunder is a San Francisco native and a third generation preacher who has served her call through prophetic, prophetic action and ministry for justice for over 30 years. This call to blend proclamation, worship, service, and advocacy on behalf of the most marginalized in church and society led to the founding of the City of Refuge United Church of Christ in 1991. In 2003, the Reverend Dr. Flunder was consecrated presiding bishop of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, a, a multi-denominational coalition of over 100 primarily African-American Christian leaders and laity. Bishop Flunder is on the board of Star King School for the Ministry and Demos, and has taught at many theological schools. She is a graduate of the Certificate of Ministry and Master of Arts program at Pacific School of Religion, and she received her Doctor of Ministry from San Francisco Theological Seminary. Bishop Flunder is also an award-winning gospel music artist and author, author of Where the Edge Gathers, the, a theology of homiletic and radical inclusion. Bishop Flunder has gone out of her way to be with us in person today. She took the red eye from the West Coast and is literally, and this is literally her first trip away from home since the pandemic began. We are honored that you would come and be with us. To begin with, Bishop Flunder and I will have about 40 minutes of conversation, just the two of us, after which we will be joined by Kelly Brown Douglas, Michelle Dibley, and Michael Vasquez for an even richer conversation. So as we begin our program for today, if prayer is something that's important in your life, I invite you to join me for the prayer of St. Francis. Let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Again, thank you so much for being with us and for taking that red eye. I think what a lot of people don't realize is that, God bless you, uh, when the gospel was being read this morning, 
we were sneaking her in behind the cameras so we could get her up in the pulpit. Her flight was late, but literally she walked in the door as the gospel was being read. And that's not a gift of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what is. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and, so thank, and thank you for that message this morning. It's that my joy. very, very powerful sermon. Thank you, brother. So my first question, I, I would love to have you share with us. You've done so many amazing things in your ministry. Your leadership has been so exemplary. You have um, had to suffer at times slings and arrows and all sorts of things. But tell us, Give us a little bit of your faith journey as a third generation preacher. How, how, did you, how, did, how do you get to where you are today? I'm from a family of preachers, uh, both men and women, although the women weren't called preachers. They definitely were, no question about that. And I'm a third generation classical Pentecostal is what I would be called. My folks were a part of the movement that came out of Azusa Street in Louisiana under William Joseph Seymour. Mm. And my grandfather was on, on Bishop Mason's, Bishop Mason is the founder of the Church of God in Christ, uh, on his original uh, board of bishops. And uh, after my grandfather, my, one of my uncles, m my mother's brother, was uh, the general secretary of the Church of God in Christ my entire family, including my father's father, who was a church founder in Berkeley, California, my folks were all Pentecostal. Everybody was Pentecostal. And so was I, of course. I was born and raised in that environment. And I had a, I, I think I say sometimes, never for, the, never, never for the, the purpose of uh, people's, other people's opinions, should you deny the authenticity of your experience. Hmm. Say I that think again. Say never that for again. the purpose of, of other people's, you understand, yes. ideas and concepts, should we ever deny the authenticity of our lived experience. Amen. I was raised a Pentecostal, and uh, I have no regret about that. I think that was where my passion for uh, prayer um, and for intimacy with God I was in the presence of and at the feet of the old women who prayed, the praying women who, who had the prayer services on Friday night late and when, when we were seeking the Spirit of God and they'd stay with you as long as you were seeking. Um, they were the, the backbone of the church and I came to know and understand the importance of personal relationship or an understanding of the divine that is much more than institutional. It's relational, it's not religious. I learned that from them. Um, and it served me in my exile from the church because I, I often say that my exile from the church of my birth would not have, hap would not have happened had it not been for the departures. And my departures were probably prim the primary one was I, I felt really drawn to justice work. And my folks were very eschatological. You know, we, we sort of believed Jesus was coming back like Friday, you know, and, and really pissed. He's late. Understand? Oh yeah, yeah. So it's very late. <laughs> But that, that was what we believed. So we, we didn't lend ourselves to a lot of things that had to do with the body politic. We were, our whole idea was to get ready, to prepare. Even, even school was an intrusion to some degree. You had to go because the law said so. But as soon as we got out of school, there was something else that we had to do that evening that had to do with, with the church. And so um, I, I I realized that I was called to justice work. I knew that. And, and it was a departure for me. I think the other reality is that I felt myself strongly as a woman to being called to pastoral ministry, which was another anathema, you know. That's not what women did. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew that early on, that I could see myself. I knew the, the charismata, you know. Uh, when I was a little girl, I'd sit sometimes on the curb by my house, and then some of the little children in the neighborhood would come sit with me, and they'd say, what are you doing? 
And I said, well, I'm sitting on the curb. And they'd say, well, can I sit there with you? And it wouldn't be long before it was like five or six of them. They said, well, so what is Yvette doing? And I realized really early on. <laughs> you had a congregation. That, yeah, that I could get a congregation, you know, that there, was, that there was something that came with the package that was me, or is me, that desired to draw people. And um, that started early. But I think the third one would be the one that really framed my exile from the church of my birth. I would still be there, likely. It was when, not because um, I am a same gender loving woman, because I am. And my partner, Shirley Miller, and I have been together for 37 years. Um, and she's the voice of Oh Happy Day. When you hear the song, the, the, the first recording, Oh Happy Day, that's, that's my Shirley Miller. And, and um, we both kind of came to this revelation at the same time, that we were called to be together. Well, that was, you know, unthought of, not because the realities of same gender loving people didn't exist in our church. And I, I say oftentimes, I didn't learn any about human intimacy outside of the church. I learned it inside of the church. It's just it, it, in the closet. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's the little piece. I, <laughs> a lot of closeted drama yeah. that goes on in cloisters. And that's, that's another day. To, you know, we'll talk about we that. We'll talk for hours about that. Yes, one. brother. But truthfully, what I felt is that I had received a gift from God. Mm. And I was not going to hide her. I was not going to hide the relationship. We loved one another. We had a genuine intimacy with one another, and we had genuine spirituality and love for God. We prayed together, and it was a connection, and I couldn't figure out how I was gonna be able to leapfrog over that uh, by pretending that she didn't exist mm. or, or holding her back in a closet somewhere. She's too great a woman for that, and I have too great a love for her. And so that was the, the, the real uh, departure. I could not understand why God would call me to something and then we use the vernacular that the kids use and then I'd have to fake the funk for the rest of my life. Mm. <laughs> I could not put those two things together. And so we both left. It's also the church of her youth. And we got involved in more uh, open and affirming uh, faith-based organizations until it became clear that we were called to together birth a ministry. And that ministry, City of Refuge, grew into the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries now in all of its settings, in this country and out of this country. And that's my next question. Yes. I want to go there with you in yeah. a minute. But let me stick with this, if mm -hmm. you don't mind, because I think so many folks um, have a, an experience that's not dissimilar to yours. Mm -hmm. And, and they find comfort in sharing and in finding a connection. Uh, so when you and Shirley, were you preaching before this or was that after? No, I was preaching before. Before. Yeah, yeah I was preaching. I've been so preaching how, since I was, was in my that, teens. That must have been a hard transition. As, I mean, how accepted were you as a female preacher? Well, the being a female preacher, as long as you didn't call it that, it was fine. <laughs> You could preach yourself blue in the face. That would be just fine. Just as long as you came up with something that had some sort of feminine tag to it. They, they would call the men preachers, they call the women evangelists. You know, or they would call the men pastors, they call the women shepherdesses. How about that? You know, they, as long as you had something that made it clear, and I have preached many times having to stand on the floor and not ascend. We couldn't go up into the pulpit. Um, in fact, the only people who got a free, only person who got a free pass was the cleaning lady. She could go into the pulpit and clean the, the furniture and such, but none of the rest of us. And you, I certainly could not ascend and go up the stairs and look down on men. I would have to do whatever speaking I did from the floor. Those were the kinds of experiences, and, and I lived with it. You know, it was a long time that I thought that that was just the way God saw things, you know? Un until, and, and maybe, maybe a good way for me to say it is that at first I believed it was justice or Jesus. You had to make up your mind. If you were really into Jesus, you couldn't do a lot of justice work. 
Then it moved to justice and Jesus, mm. where I began to see the concomitant streams, right? And now I'm reaching a point when I watch the church in its present setting, I'm looking, I'm calling it justice for Jesus. Because I think Jesus is getting a really bad rap. Amen. In the time that we live in by some of the people who call the name of Jesus. So it has been a progression, a real progression from being a classical Trinitarian Pentecostal, not to be confused with the oneness Pentecostals and the baptism in Jesus' name. I was a Father, Son, Holy Ghost <laughs> baptism Pentecostal. And we Pentecostals didn't think each other were going to heaven either. Just to show you how narrow, <laughs> it was a narrow path. I'm not playing. It was tough. But, but you know, that would be my uh, 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 essential part of the journey, I think. And how was your, when you and Shirley, when you realized that that was something that you, there was, couldn't be any closets involved, mm -hmm. um, what was the experience like with your family and friends? Exile. Yeah. Isolation. I think that the, I think a lot of people could bear exile and isolation if they have a great love in their lives. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people who don't have a great love in their lives, the thought of exile and isolation is very hard. I would say that I did experience it, no question about that, for a period of years. Because, you know, I'm, I'm from those circles where people isolate you and shame you and hope that you'll come back because you've been isolated and shamed. <laughs> that's sad, isn't it? It is sad. But that's very typical in settings like that. Um, it didn't work for me because I was very much in love and not, um, I was not without lust, let's be clear, but I wasn't in lust, I was in love. <laughs> and there's a distinct difference, you know. Um, and um, it, was, it was great enough and wonderful enough and holy enough for me to wait for all the other things, domestic partnership, marriage, um, I couldn't, I couldn't have loved her more because we were able to be legally married. Um, that did come in time. But, but the fact that I felt called to her and I felt she felt called to me was the reason we together birthed a church. No question about that. So I'm grateful, but the exile was difficult with my family because my whole family was in this denomination. It was difficult with, you know, people who still push back. Has there been some healing there? Oh, absolutely. Okay. You know, my mother's gone to heaven. Uh, my father, my stepfather, my brother, um, have all gone to heaven. But my mother, uh, we didn't talk for a number of years. And when we did talk, it was terse, you know. Um, and I was praying one day, and then actually praying and weeping about it because I had missed her for a good while. And um, Spirit dropped something while I was praying into my mind, just one word, shopping. My mother loves to shop. I about to say, that's a dangerous word. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. But it hit me, shopping, and I knew exactly what it meant. And I called um, my mama on a Monday morning, and she gave me that kind of terse answer. I said, so, hi, Mama, how are you doing? She said, fine. Big pause. Right. And so I said, I wanted to check in. And she said, well, good. Everything's one kind of one word <laughs> answers. I said, so I've been thinking about you, and I, I want to come and get you. She said, where are we going? I said, shopping. And a hush fell on the call. And the next thing she said is, what time are you coming? <laughs> you know, and, and we had several of these sessions. Sure. Um, Monday became our day. And I went and picked her up and I, you know, bought everything. I, I spent the money, you know. Right. Bought everything, carrying her packages. I was burdened down, but I was carrying her around. And so we didn't introduce any of these conversations. We just spent some time. And finally, she began to ask me hard questions, really hard questions. And I got a chance to share with her my journey for the first time, mm. to really share with her. And in the middle of one of those dialogues that she raised, she said to me, she said, shut up, Yvette. So when, when you knew my mama, that's what you would have done mm. at that moment. 
So a little later on, I said, so why did you want me to shut up? She said, because if what you are saying is true, because we talked about everything, she asked me really significant questions, you know, about, even about women's ministries, to your point. She said, if what you are saying is true, what I have believed for 60 plus years of my life, I didn't have to believe. And what I had to endure, I didn't have to endure. Mm. And she said to me, she said, you know, of course, that makes me feel like a fool. And I oh, said to Mama, I said, Mama, I think you put your finger on why some people stay so long in places that steal from them and stop them from being their best and highest self and stop them from coming into the dreams and visions that they really feel God is giving them. And she said, how, she wanted to know how could she deal with it. She says, I feel like a fool. Well, I said, but you're not dead. You got time. Well, how and profound a revelation she had. I mean, oh, that's honey, let yeah. me tell you something about my real churchy mama, because my mom was churchy. She was churchy Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the whole weeks. I hear the, my doorbell ring one day. I went to the door and I told Shirley, I said, that's mama ringing the doorbell because she did like this. That's how I knew it was her. So I went downstairs and there she was. Now this is my mama. She's church wear all the time, right? There she is at my door. She's got a, a J-Lo warm-up suit on. <laughs> She's holding this woman don't wear pants. Do you understand what oh, I'm saying? Yeah. J-Lo, J-Lo, and, and she had a hat with sequins all in it, the jingle bobs, it was a cap, and it was kind of sitting on the side of her head like this, and tennis shoes with, with some Dealey Bob jewelry or something on it. I couldn't believe it. I said, Mama? She said, yes. I said, so what happened? <laughs> she said, well, I just came by for a minute to tell you I'm free. Oh. I cannot even begin to tell you what that did for me. Mm. And my mother left her denomination and came to be our national leader of prayer for the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries. <laughs> That's wonderful. And the mother of so many whose mothers were detached from them. Mm. She became the mother of the movement. My mother, my birth mother, became the mother of our organization. And I must tell you how incredibly blessed we were by her presence and her prayers. That makes me tear up. That's yeah. amazing. It's oh, true. that's wonderful. It's true. And when, when did she die? How long ago did you lose her? Mama's been gone since 2007. How old was she when she died? She was 74. She too was young, 74. Too young. Yeah, too, too young. young. So let's, let's jump right yeah. into that. So tell us about City of Refuge. Tell yes. us about its 30th anniversary, right? Yes. Tell us how that come, came about. It's an amazing ministry. Well, City of Refuge was developed um, as a non-denominational church. Uh, we started that way because we couldn't really figure exactly where to go. The, the so we, was it you and Shirley? Me and Shirley and 12 other people. 12 other people. In our family. Now how appropriate, 12, we got 12, 12 people, others. how about that? Yeah. Well, we had 12 people and then we had 15 people and then we had 20 people and Shirley said, we've got to get the people out of the house. I said, that's the truth. I said, we have a, <laughs> we have a church in the family room and they were eating up all the food and a lot of them would want to talk way in the night and have to spend the night so they wouldn't have to drive home and like that and that's, and Shirley said, no, we got nothing. We got to find a place, for, and she was right. And when it was time, it was time. Um, and we began much the same as how we are now. We incorporated City of Refuge as a nonprofit, California nonprofit, and alongside that, incorporated a 501c3 mm. for services in the heat of the epidemic. You know, the epidemic uh, was just starting to rear its head, mm. the AIDS epidemic. AIDS. And, um, we had to serve. And that was back in the day, you know, when I would pick people up bodily and put them in my car and take them to the ER because the ambulances wouldn't come. And, they, and I've had them die before I could get them there. That kind of experience. Um, it was the heat of the epidemic and all of the isolation and prejudice and concepts and the Ronald Reagan not paying attention realities that had to do with, with AIDS. And 
We realized that because we were same gender loving people with AIDS in our hands, that it, we weren't going to be a mega church. We weren't going to grow like that. And so we didn't have a denomination that was helping us. And people were trying to steer away from the kind of work that we were doing, including same gender loving people. You know, there was just a great fear that encompassed the, the epidemic. So we had a 501c3, and, we, and so the way that we really funded our ministry was, of course, the giving of the people. But we started also by seeking people who were concerned in institutions and, and funders that were concerned about HIV. And we put those things together in a way that created a model of what, what is church in the inner city? Inner city, the third world of the United States. What is church in the inner city uh, if it is all worship and not really including the service, services that are needed by the people who are most marginalized both by church and society? And we have not had those things in a top-down relationship where this is the church and then down here are all the services we do. We have sort of Letty Russell's concept of, of church in the round where our service realities are equally as holy as our worship. In fact, we consider what we do in service to be worship. Holy work. Yes. I am not the only pastor in my church. I'm a senior pastor. But we have sort of a wagon wheel um, way in which we are uh, pastoring together. All of our pastors are part-time with us and also have some relationship to the other areas that they are connected to. Mm. Some of them are counselors, mental and emotional health counselors. Some of them are educators. Um, some of them are grant writers, hallelujah. Several things that folks do, and each spoke makes the wheel. Now, we pass around the preaching too, you know what I'm saying, and worship and all of that, but all of us have an area of expertise. Everybody's degreed, a double degreed, a triple degreed in some cases. But the, those are the skills that we bring back to the church to help the church be the church, like a church without walls. Right. And imagining, we imagine church as church having clear windows where we can fully see out into the community and the community can fully see into us. That was the way we began. That was, was the design that we encourage the churches that are part of the fellowship that we are not basically just put together to have, you know, choreographed moments for Jesus. What we want to do is put our hands all the way, not just distant, but all the way where the struggle is. Mm. That's the way we see Ye Yeshua ben Yosef, the brown Palestinian Jew, hallelujah, mm. <laughs> with a, a message and a ministry in the people's houses and on the hillside and in the places where the, the poor and dispossessed really are. That, so we bought our buildings for that. We bought buildings that we could have nonprofits be in those buildings. And each time we move from a building to a building, we just expanded the number of nonprofit agencies and services, both ours that were under our 501c3 and the things that we don't do that others do, we brought them into. Mm -hmm. So church is one thing we do. So how extensive is the, is the network now? Locally or, or nationally? Any way you want to answer. Well, locally, uh, we have a 31,000 square foot building of miscellaneous services. It includes a clinic. Mm -hmm. It includes a full gym, a real gym you know, with the machines and the, all the different things that you jump up and down on and the balls that you hit against the wall and all that stuff. There's all of us in there, right? And several other things I could say to you that are part of, the, of what we do. And you need, you need room. But each one of those organizations brings its own budget. And they can help to sustain the building. But we have an amalgamation of services. We encourage that in our churches to there are specialties in basically all of those areas. When I say areas, I mean all of those physical locations and cities and such where, where churches and faith-based organizations 
And I need to put a comma there and say that some of the faith-based faith organizations are not churches. That's another piece that I think is so very important. Being pastoral does not mean having a parish. Mm. Well said. There's all sorts of ways to be pastoral. Mm -hmm. And we have to be able to give some credence to the fact that being the church is not, in, in my thinking, like the twofold job. Either you're a preacher or, or a clergy person or you're a musician. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest, and the poor administrators just kind of get kicked to the curb. <laughs> right, I mean, right. To give people something to aspire to, mm -hmm. like, like, like when we take the, the bread and the, and, the, and the wine, what if it was, you know, coffee and a bagel? Could it still be a time of communion with people at Starbucks? You know, the, the concept of moving into a broader sense of what that means, means that we find people doing holy work that work with herbs and healing oils. And, and um, they're healers, people who do deep counseling for people with church burns. They're healers. You know, people who help the trans community who have been so, so horribly diminished, especially by religion, help people to pass through that water and still be in, in relationship with God, the God of their understanding. And they specialize in that. That's what they do. You know, there's so much that I could say how much broader the table of God is when we begin to, and, they're, and now they're everywhere. We're, we are in, in Ghana, we are in Rwanda, we're in Kenya. We are, are connected to our, our, our beloved in South Africa, uh, Mexico, and then in just about every major city, there is either an entrepreneurial initiative that is holistic and holistically based, or there is a church, or there is a nonprofit uh, working to bring the kingdom of God. I think eschatologically, we have missed the mark. And it's, it's kind of in that Justice for Jesus piece, the third part of what it is that I'm engaged in. Mm -hmm. The Justice for Jesus says, that we are not called to focus on getting to heaven. Mm -mm. Our job is to bring heaven to earth. Thy Jesus kingdom hardly come. talked about that. That's going what to he heaven. said, didn't yeah, he? Yeah. On earth, on earth, the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. The on earth is, is really not getting enough play as far as I'm concerned. It's just too much about the, about the then and there and not enough about the here and now. Amen. Yeah, so, and ecological work, you know, caring for the earth. I, I want my grandchildren to have a planet. But eschatologically, we are totally against that because this concept of the soon coming king, which is what, what I was raised on, is the reason why we didn't care about the earth. And a lot of the super conservative Christians that are out there, same thing. They'll be building bunkers in the backyard. That, you know, that can happen. Yeah. And, and getting, you know, food, uh, uh, you know, dry food to put in the bunkers. I just, the whole thing just, <laughs> but anyway, they, they're, <laughs> they're into that. You know, I mean, really hard into that yeah. because they're expecting an apocalypse. And what I'm saying back to them is that the way that you handle the earth, you're making an apocalypse. Exactly. You're creating, a, mm -hmm. if you care about this mm -hmm. planet, she is all of our mother. There is no one that has ever existed that is not still here. Either their carbon, their, their, their carbon dioxide is still in the air, their bodies have made soil, right? right. You, can't, you can't ever go. Mm -mm. <laughs> I don't care how you died, I don't care what they do with you. Some part of you is still in the earth. She is our mother. And how can we not care for her and say that we really do appreciate the creation of God in the, in the planet Earth. So there's so much that we miss. And one of the worst things I think we ever did was have a Christianity that said the goal was to get elsewhere, yes. right? Because then you don't have to care about the here and exactly. now. Exactly. If, you, if you're after the, the there, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that stealing the humanity from Jesus 
yes. and turning Jesus into, it's such a paradox, isn't it? We say very God and very man. We, we say Jesus can be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. We say that Jesus was very human. We, we try to understand when Jesus prayed deeply that if Jesus is God, who was he talking to? When he asked, let this cup pass. Who was that? If you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So exactly what is it that we have done to Jesus? And I who am a lover of Jesus, who called Jesus' name and pray. But simultaneously, we took Jesus' fundamental things. And he's, as a person who has to counsel people all the time, even about human sexuality. Yeah, so took all the, that away. One of the greatest mistakes we made was to suggest that Jesus was very human and he could never have in intimacy. Nobody lets him have anybody. I said, poor Jesus. He just did he just, nobody gives him anything. <laughs> See, he just doesn't get to love anybody or have a love relationship with anybody, which makes that. it seem like that's what God wants if you're going to really be holy. Right. That's that Greek dualism, that yes. the body's bad and the spirit's good. And that's crazy making. It is crazy. And I said, said to people sometimes, you know, yes, I love the Lord with all you know, my thoughts and in my heart. I love God with all my heart and out of my belly full of rivers of living water. Then you jump down to your knees. I love my knees that they bow before God and my feet run after God. But what about what's between my navel and my knees? <laughs> Where is God on that? <laughs> and, and if I'm beautifully and fearfully and wondrously made, then God made all that stuff just between my navel and my knees. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about y'all's, but mine is good. <laughs> mine, yes, and I, pray, and I praise God for it. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's a great blessing. And so, but we took that from Jesus. And then we try to make like that we believe Jesus to be very human and very divine. Well, my very human is human all the way around. And it is beautifully and it is wondrously made by the hands of a master. And I believe that with my whole heart. I believe my spirit is beautifully and wondrously shared with my relationship with God. And they are not in conflict with one another. Mm -hmm. The conflict is between my flesh and religion. That is the conflict. So I jettison that because that's where all the guilt and shame comes. And it also helps me to do the things that are healthy and helpful and, and jettison the things that are harmful and problematic, right? That is a complete, that's a, a resurrection of Jesus. It gives Jesus justice. Jesus deserves not to be blamed for what we have done to Jesus. Mm, amen. Jesus deserves better than that. Jesus needs a campaign called Save Jesus. And, and <laughs> as versus Jesus saves, <laughs> we need save me some signs. Save Jesus. Tell the truth about Jesus. Save Jesus, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that Jesus can be unlocked from what we have created. You know, who is this almost, almost a monster of hatred? and vitriol and, and condemnation and threats. That is not the Jesus of my understanding. That is not the Jesus that I serve. That is not the Jesus who's, who I am a disciple of. Nor is he the um, incredibly skinny, almost physically deteriorated uh, Jesus that we get in the medieval Renaissance Come art on, of, of Jesus, you know, the, where his humanity so is just diminished. Poor Jesus. Yeah. And, that's, and that is exactly, so God is like an alcoholic father in this concept who throws lightning bolts mm. and it gets very sensitive. Mm. He's very sensitive. You can piss him off really, really mm. easily, right? I always call him the crazy uncle. Crazy uncle. Yeah. And Mary's crying all the time. She's just broken and crying. So we just have sanctified her tears because she's just, bless her heart, she just, almost every time we see her, she's crying. And Jesus is emaciated. <laughs> and we're going to invite people to that. I mean, now come on. I mean, that's, and we've been doing this for years. It's, and it's been working in some situations, you know. You know, but then there are cloisters that tell the truth that are different. I'm saying break the doors off the cloisters. 
Let's, let's, as people of faith, let's talk about what it really is. I prayed for a lot of people to be healed and they didn't get healed. Because mm. not everybody's going to be healed. Mm. I prayed for people, you know, to, to, to get this or that or this or that or this or that because I hoped that it would be, but it didn't always happen. And I think that our call to ministry has to include how do we help people through the certain inevitabilities of the vicissitudes of life, right? Question of evil. Yes, brother. Yes, indeed. And that's all a part of it. Yes. That is a part of it. We have to, we're, we're all going to die. We've got to get, we've got to get die ready and not think that we've been mistreated and maligned because that's coming to us, mm -hmm. right? And we want, then we want to also leave a better world so that our, our you know, if epithelials will make for a better world. Our breath, our touch, our love, our presence will shift the atmosphere in some way, so. You were so inspiring to many, um, and you, your message offers not only challenge, but great hope. What inspires you? Where do you find inspiration these days? I think, well, in the COVID, I have been in awe of the way the Spirit has helped us to shift into what we have to shift into in order to really still reach people who need to hear from us. And there are some people who couldn't make those changes. You mean the digital shifts? Is that what you oh, mean? Oh, that's just part of it. Yeah, you know, part of but it. But even the, the how we have worship, mm -hmm. what we're accustomed to seeing, what we're accustomed to doing, mm -hmm. you know? I think the people who can't change will likely die. And that includes, and I don't mean physically die, I mean that their institutions will die. And it affects everything from theological schools to, to uh, actual worship centers, because I think we have to be able to understand that in some cases we're gonna have to turn them into something other than what they are if they're gonna serve people. That's, that's an important thing. And when we're not accustomed to that or even ever imagining that, it's like, oh my God, we cannot have people in here doing that. Well, you know, <laughs> that kind of reality. So I think that, that on a personal level, what it did for me, because this is my first airline trip and I'm somebody that traveled half the year, um, at least half the year. My first time away on a plane in two years is to come to you. And we're so honored by and, that. Oh, I wanted to come. It was my desire to come. Um, and I appreciate the invitation. But I had to learn to do things differently. And in about maybe six or eight months, we had, we had about 60 plus new members who could not come to us directly, but they can come to us virtually. Some as far away as Germany and England, right? And I said to God, I said, you're opening up a door that we wouldn't have opened. <laughs> There are several doors that have opened yeah, that we wouldn't have opened that. had we not had Absolutely. this experience, right? There's so, been a lot of grace. Oh, so I keep listening and watching, right? And for me personally, I spend, I spend more time with my spouse, which, and my children, my grandchildren, which really blesses me too, you know, of, of the flesh and spirit, you know, my children and my grandchildren. And then, um, more intimate time with the congregation, even though I don't see them, because now they call a lot. <laughs> and you can just pop in with them. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's so different than how it once was. And then I think the other things, I've become a, a plant mother, a plant parent. As a vegetation plant? Honey, let me tell you. First, I got like two or three plants. <laughs> anybody, anybody else have that addiction? That's one, there we go. All right. So, and I know some of you all listening to us, you had this, anyway. So plants, you get a plant, then you get another plant, then you get another plant, then you have to study. Some of them need light, some of them don't need light, some of them need a little leaf spray, some of them have to have uh, watering once a month, once every two weeks. So it's quite something. You gotta know what light to put, because you know they'll die on you. Yeah, they will. And I mean die. I mean, it's, I come in there one day and they just lay this like, 
And I look at, and I say, what's the matter with you? What did we do? And I have to go do my research. <laughs> then I have to keep them from getting, it's like a congregation. I have to keep them from getting each other sick <laughs> because they have stuff and then they have to be quarantined. There's a lot of sermons in this, brother. They have to be quarantined until they get better. Then I can bring them back out and they can join the congregation again. It's just really quite something. But I have learned so much about um, each of them sort of teach me something, you know. And I realized, I didn't realize I had an affinity for plants. You got a green thumb. I mean, I didn't know that here. I didn't, I didn't have, to have time to know it because it takes patience. That's one of the gifts of the pandemic, wasn't it? Patience. Yeah. I have, and I have, I, the way that it showed up for me is, is in the work that I do at City of Refuge and then in a larger fellowship. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, we were, we're date conscious. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this and this. The epidemic continues to shift those realities mm -hmm. and how we do them. And I've learned to treat my larger responsibility much like I do my plants. Sometimes I just have to wait and see how they blossom or how they bloom or how they grow. Just keep watering them. Keep watering them. Keep feeding them. They have to have a little stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and watch them and then make some decisions a little further down the line. But I'm not nearly as focused on having to do things in almost a, in, in such a coordinated way in the ways I have in the past. I'm much more patient with the processes. And I'd like to thank my plants. <laughs> you know, and the ones that are the hardest to grow and keep are succulents. If you try to grow them indoors. And they taught me a great lesson. You know, they will grow for you. They like to grow outside. And they like to be left alone. You know, I. I've learned that there are a lot of people that are like that. Amen. You know, mm -hmm. and I got a lot of succulents. <laughs> <laughs> I've been succulated, something terrible. So, so I think that there's this, these are the lessons and as it's, 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 it's trivial as that may seem, I've had a number of life lessons like that mm -hmm. in the last several months now and now years. It's been a couple of years that I've been, you know, working from home, working hard, been zoominated almost to death. I know, gosh. You know, but I am learning to be more patient with God's process and with God's people and with myself. And we had to learn how yeah. to not to be in control all the time. You see what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, amen. Because we're not in control. We're, we never were, but no. we used to fool well, we ourselves we were, into huh? it. Yeah, didn't we? <laughs> Michelle, I have no idea what time it is. Mm -hmm. I've been having so much fun. Is it time? That's been a right, y'all come on up there. We have some more folks to enter yeah, into yeah, the conversation. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Great. I have about 12 more questions too, but I'm gonna let other folks ask. All so. right. Feel free, brother. Hi, family. <laughs> this is excellent. Good to see your whole face. So, we're going to give the uh, Dean and uh, Bishop Flinder a break for just a moment. Okay. <laughs> my name's Michelle Dibley. I'm the program director here at the Cathedral. And I'd like to welcome with me to this platform uh, Mr. Michael Vasquez, yes. who is the director of the Religion and Faith Program HRC. at the HRC Foundation. Right. And has a, he's an organizer and a, uh, I was going to say preacher, but there's another word you use. Oh, that's, that's the one that's on the website. <laughs> and, uh, and a public sure. theologian and uh, spent a number of years working in uh, college campuses, Christian college campuses, founding an organization called Brave Commons that yes. worked with LGBTQ students on campus. Yes? yes Great. Yes. And uh, also uh, Dean uh, Kelly Brown Douglas, who is the canon theologian at Washington National Cathedral, and a great friend of ours, and uh, also an extensive author and preacher and yes, teacher indeed. from around the country. So we are grateful to both of you for yes, joining indeed. us. So we are having this conversation the weekend of Juneteenth, mm -hmm. which is about emancipation and liberation, and also during Pride Month, mm -hmm. which is a, a time that is now a celebration for many in our community yes. and an opportunity for people to come as we are 
and uh, to celebrate. And I want to start with a, a little bit more conversation about freedom and emancipation and liberation. And in part because, as you just shared with us, Bishop Plunder, the, the church is not necessarily a place where we all come to get free. <laughs> that is not necessarily the experience yeah, that, that we have all had. And that's yet true. you have described such great joy. Mm -hmm. And I can hear it in your mm -hmm. voice and feel it emanate from you as you talk about your leadership in the church. Mm -hmm. So I would love to invite um, Michael and or Kelly, one yes. of you to go first, <laughs> since Bishop Blender has just been talking. So I'm going to call on Michael and make you go first so that you don't do this <laughs> back and forth thing. But just tell us a little bit about where do you find joy in being in this institution, knowing that it's an institution that doesn't always welcome mm -hmm. those of us who are part of this community. So where do you find joy? What's that like? Not here. Um, and that's just being absolutely honest. I've it was a long journey for me to come to the realization like church could be that place. Church could easily be the place where I find liberation. It could be the, the place where I find joy, but it's not been it, right? It's been in community amongst my queer siblings where I felt welcome, I felt nurtured, I felt cared for, where I could ask real questions about myself and who, like, who I was becoming, um, where there was you see, like in, in the church, right, like in ministry that I've done in the past, right, as I've wrestled with questions around sexual orientation or gender identity or expression, like what does it mean to be who I think God is telling me, like she wants me to be, I think, maybe, right, there is a pressure within the walls of the church, right? There has always been, at least in my experience, to conform and perform in a certain way, even in affirming spaces, right, even in quote unquote LGBTQ affirming spaces, it's been a great, like you can be queer here, you can be gay here, cool, but it's, it has to look like this, right? Like it, we have our perfect vision, our perfect image, um, and so we would like to fashion you into our image of a gay Christian or a gay person of faith, um, and that's exhausting, right? Like I did not like exit one closet to get like pushed into a different one, right? Like this is, you know, and so it's in like, and we've often talked about, right, like, you hear folks talking about, like, queer bars or clubs or just gatherings that are quote-unquote secular, um, being a place of experiencing the divine outside of the church because there is a rawness, a, a vulnerability, um, and a particular kind of glory that you experience um, by seeing folks just show up in fully as who they are, and then being able to engage. It's, these aren't perfect places, but there's joy there because there's authenticity in ways in the church has never nurtured for us. Thank you. And uh, Dean Douglas, you have spent years being an advocate and a supporter of those of us who want to come into the church. And uh, so talk a little bit about how you find joy in, in that part of your work. Well, thank you. Uh, for having me in this space, and thank you, uh, Bishop Flanders and uh, Michael, for being here. <laughs> the moment you asked that question, Michelle, my mind went back to when I was little, mm -hmm. and my mother taught my brother and my two sisters and I the song, Jesus Loves You, This I Know Because the Bible Tells Me So. And she would sing that to us. She couldn't sing, so she, <laughs> at all, she thought she could, but she couldn't. Uh, uh, she would sing that song to us almost every night. And I didn't appreciate why she did that until later, because she wanted us to know that Jesus loved us because she knew that her children, blessed with Ebony Grace, were going to go out into a world that didn't love them. And she wanted us to be able to call up on that song. Well, that stayed with me, it stayed with me, sort of deep in my soul. And I would take that song into church, right? And, and into a church where when I came through the church, we couldn't be ac girls, couldn't be acolytes or any of that. And by the way, Bishop Flunders, I have preached for many a time on the, on the floor, yes. not in a pulpit, because yes. people have confused my name. They thought Kelly was a, a, a male. Yeah. Then I get to the church and, oh, no. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I've, yes. I've been asked not to go into the pulpit. 
So the joy first came in knowing Jesus, regardless of what was going on in the church. That kept me in the church. Then as I grew in the church and grew into myself, I understood that if Jesus loved me, Jesus loves everybody else too. And I found joy in really being with those people in the church. There's always, there's always this kernel, if you will, in the church of people who try to show forth the love that is Jesus. And that's all I've ever tried to do. And that brings me joy. That's how I first met <laughs> Bishop Flinders years and years ago now. Uh, and so I find the real joy I really do in the work of letting people know and being with the people who know that Jesus loves them and loves everybody else. Yes, 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 yes. Bishop, do you want to add to this? Where's the joy? Oh, I have all the amen that's inside of you. <laughs> um, I think that, that our journey, because we were able to create it, was a both and for, for us. We, we knew that there were places that we could not go. So we, the question was, how do we create something that we can call church without, or sans the oppressions that we experienced? Because, you know, my truth is, I, you know, I have had incredible drama with and among gay people. I want to kind of put that out on the floor, too, to say that it, it's, it's it is not an easy thing to be in the company of people who have been broken. And there are issues that arise. And sometimes when we all get together, we take that out on each other. And that, I have seen that happen. I've been right in the middle of that at times. We have blood on the floor too. <laughs> because hurt people hurt people. There's no question about that. But the healing, often came and comes now when we are diligently making the effort to create something that won't do to us or do to others what was done to us. And we find out how much, and some of the greatest pushback that I have ever had about that are the folks that continues, as my brother said, to be in the shadows in other places. They are content to be in the shadows because there are other things that they like. The, the grandeur of the black church is something to experience if you've never seen it. When it's really church hats, I'm trying to wait a minute, let me tell you about church hats. And church clothes and church regalia and choirs marching down the center aisle. And I said, there are people that love the pageantry. And a lot of gay people, almost, okay, this is gonna get me in trouble, but I'm gonna get on that and say, <laughs> almost all of the great black musicians that I know, I'll just leave a comma there. You can fill in the rest. My truth is, I know why people remain. But to, to create something else means that we have to do more than be disturbed about what we left. We have to do some incredible self-examination. And what are the vestiges? What remains in us that would prohibit our becoming community? I have seen uh, what gay people can do to trans people. I've experienced that, just like I can, how church men can do to church women, but I've also seen what church women can do to church women. <laughs> hurt people hurt people. And I think that, the, that the, the deep work is not just to change the atmosphere and the institutions, but to have a love, a love that is so deep that it also transforms us. Mm. Because God has a real, God's got jokes, let me tell you, just so you know. God has a way of sending you back to the people that harmed you at times to bring them hope. And I have experienced the church that exiled me and visiting them for events and have them come to the back of the church to get me and bring me to the front and sit me with the preachers. I've lived long enough to see that happen. 
What a blessing that is. That's a form of apology from my folks. And I have a, ch I have a choice in that moment. Either I'm going to say something that's sort of, sort of like, kiss my entire, you know, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. You didn't hear that. <laughs> oh, it's on tape. I'm so sorry. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I have an option to say that. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, that's what you can do for me. You perhaps you have forgotten, what, you know. <laughs> or I can graciously say, thank you, and, and go down there and sit and have everybody in the service looking at me like this. But there's a, there's a statement being made mm -hmm. in that moment. Yeah. Does that make sense? Some growth. Yes, on both sides. Mm -hmm. Because I've had to, there were good things there once yeah. for me. Yeah. I learned some great things. And, and, and just, just one other thing. Never, I said, for the sake of anybody's opinions of you, deny the authenticity of your experience. And I was thinking about uh, Mother Virgie Lee Hunter and Mother Jessie Mae Gatson, because we call the older women mother. So Mother Virgie Lee Hunter and Mother Jessie Mae Gatson stayed with me when I was a young Pentecostal seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost, because you had to seek the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know about this. You had to seek the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they stayed after church, and they kept praying with me, you know, and praying with me. Get you. Put your mind on Jesus, honey. Just keep calling on him. Put your mind on Jesus. Don't, don't get distracted. Put your mind on Jesus. They prayed for me. And I had a, a spiritual experience, kind of like what like the whirling dervishes in the Muslim tradition have, or, or, or Native American people in a sweat lodge, you know, where I had a vision and knew that I had a vision. And I'll never deny the authenticity of my experience. And, and em, embrace the Spirit of God in that manifestation. I think that God sometimes gifts you with what you desire, right? And I came out of it, and Mother Hunter and Mother Gasson said, that's it, you got it. And when they said that was it, because, honey, they were hard on you, you know, they, they made you pray till something happened, right? They said, that's it. And from then they embraced them, and they loved me, and they had, you know, great big bosoms, and so when they embraced you, you were really embraced, you know. And I was a little bit, a little something, and they embraced me, and they held on to me, you know, and loved on me about my, my baptism, my, my spiritual elevation in their thinking, right? I'll never forget them. Barely educated, almost functioning Ill illiterate, but those old sisters blessed my whole socks off. And that's the, con there are those connections that still exist. And I thank God, for, and they're real, and they're authentic. And I thank God for it. And now, in, in the age that I am now, I'll be 66 in a few days, those things are now converging. The who I am and the who I was into something that hopefully can help people that at one time in my life, I thought I would never be in the company of again. That's a full circle journey. That is a blessing. That, journey. Oh, I thank God for it. Too. That's good news too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am struck by, um, Bishop, your description of that journey as you sit next to someone who's working with young people. Absolutely. Right? Who's working with um, college students. Mm -hmm. and, uh, can you talk a little bit about what that ministry is like and those of us yes. who want to help connect with young LGBTQ folks? What can our, are there things that our churches can do or that we can do as people of faith outside of our church mm -hmm. spaces that, that can keep that, um, that connection open? For people yes, to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I don't work with Brave Commons directly anymore, um, but it was a ministry that started organically very much out of my living room, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's not a template, but it usually starts in a living room, right? Like, it was like, I, I met these, um, I was in seminary and I met these undergrads, the nearby college, same denomination, um, queer students who were just looking for support. Mm -hmm. It was, a toxic environment, their, their chaplain would often say horrific things about the queer and trans community. And then you have these students who are required to sit through this, right? They're required to sit and hear this, hear these horrific things from faculty. Mm -hmm. um, their parents have 
require that they attend these schools because um, otherwise they won't pay for the education. Mm -hmm. So these, these students are really without choice, right? Um, in a society that demands that you get an undergrad degree just mm -hmm. so that you can get a minimum wage job. Mm -hmm. But that's a whole other <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tangent. Um, and so I just started mentoring them, right? Like not being that much older than them at the time, I'm like, I, mm -hmm. I'll give you what I got, right? Like, mm -hmm. which is I got some snacks and a Bible, <laughs> right? Like, and a prayer, right? Like yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. it, right? And mm -hmm. having recently gone through, like I had this stint in an evangelical organization for a few years and having gone through my own mm. rough exit, um, I knew what it was like for these students walking through fire, walking through mm -hmm. hell at a place that claimed to be the road to heaven, right? Um, and w the struggle I had, right, there were some churches in the area that like definitely supported by like bringing, you know, snacks to students when we'd have Bible study. But when things got really difficult, right, when which was there's a there's a limit to how much we can gather in a living room and talk about how horrible the conditions are um, for queer students at the school without demanding something more. Mm -hmm. um, and so things pivoted, right? Like I could give you spiritual advice, I could give you wisdom. I'm like I'm 25. Like I, I can give you like whatever I got, right? Um, I was 25 at the time, right? Like, but um, what are we going to do to actually change the structures and the systems that continue to perpetuate this? Because one day you will graduate mm -hmm. and you will go off into yep. this big old world and you will find your place. Um, that I have hope in, right? Mm -hmm. For the, all, all of the folks I continue to work with through my role at HRC, like, that my hope is in there is a place in this world for you. Yes, brother. You're, you're going to find it and let's help you get there, right? We'll get there together, right? That's Mujerista theology is that in conjunto we go together, mm -hmm. like hand in hand, right? Um, we'll, pack a, we'll pack a lunch and we'll get there. Mm -hmm. um, but what are we going to do about right, the next generation of queer yes. students and trans students that show up at this school that I'm not going to still be here, right? Like, literally, I got expelled from the seminary. Like, I'm not going to be here, right? Like, y'all ain't going to be, who's going to help them mm -hmm. unless we challenge the structure, right? Mm -hmm. And the wild thing was, and my personal experience was like, yeah, I, I learned scripture first mm -hmm. in a very conservative environment. They taught me how to unpack, highlight everything, circle mm -hmm. this, triangle that, like draw a line across the page, right, 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 tabs everywhere, <laughs> which was the yeah. worst thing they probably could have done because when these conservative evangelicals taught me how to read scripture, I read it. Yes, brother, yes, yes. And what I saw was from Genesis to Revelation, a consistent thread of people saying no, to the forces of evil, these structures of power that continue to try to dominate, exclude, and abuse, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, well, the, the roadmap's right here. We're, we're mm -hmm. gonna use, this is the book you gave me. <laughs> so we're gonna use it. And mm -hmm. so these students um, at this one particular college before we expanded to, to many others, led a protest in the chapel. I'm like, this is, this is in John 2, the story's repeated elsewhere, right? Like Jesus comes in, it's in the temple, it's in the mm -hmm. house and flips the table over. You don't like it, it's mm -hmm. uncomfortable. If someone walked in here mm -hmm. and flipped the altar over, right? <laughs> that would be uncomfortable, right, mm -hmm. to everybody, right? Like we don't have a moment. Um, mm -hmm. But would we pause long enough to listen to the demand and the anger and the rage and the holiness mm -hmm. behind that action? I'll tell you that one college didn't, but what it did do, right, is mm -hmm. that story spread from college to college to college, and these other queer students at these other Christian schools were like, oh, I got a table to flip too. <laughs> like, I got, I have stories, I have something to do as well. And, mm -hmm. and what I hoped then, and I saw glimmers of, and what I, to, and what I wish for today, yeah. as students continue to fight, and they continue to struggle, is that the church would realize it's not about putting, I mean, yes, we love a rainbow flag. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We love a progress flag, we love a trans flag, like we, yes, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. What are you gonna do beyond that to mm -hmm. show the evidence of your commitment to a community mm -hmm. that continues to be attacked? Mm -hmm. I don't care if you put a trans flag outside the, the walls or the, the doors of the chapel, if you're not going to advocate for the trans community yeah. that continues to be targeted and hunted yeah. and, and murdered, then your flag don't mean anything to the community. When it is conservative evangelicals and Catholics and other Christians who are pushing mm -hmm. anti-trans legislation across the country right. and saying, like, putting out horrific statements about the trans community 
And y'all ain't doing, progressive churches aren't getting engaged, aren't getting involved. Mm -hmm. But you got to translate, I guess. Happy Pride? Mm -hmm. That don't mean anything, right? You need to, you need to step outside, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus, yeah. what we see, not just yeah. in Jesus, you yeah. get to act, right? We see consistent heritage in our faith of facing uh, political structures and religious structures and saying, this is wrong and doing something about it, not just preaching about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. Like, that's mm -hmm. cute, but like, are you going to get out into the yeah, world, absolutely. get your hands dirty and, and face the fire? And that's what I wish the church would do. Good job. So let's stay with that sort of arena for a minute, right? Because I don't think it's just LGBTQIA concerns mm -hmm. that could be part of the church's work outside the door, yeah, right? right? So what is it, what is a, a healthy, faithful, grounded participation in the public arena look like from a faith community? Mm. What's that, what stories do y'all have? What stories do you tell? And, and Dean, I want to include you in this too, because mm -hmm. I know this has been some of your, your work as a clergy person for a long time, right? So mm -hmm. what does it look like for the church in a really healthy, loving way to step outside of these walls into what you were just talking about, Michael? I'm going to leave that there for a second until somebody feels called to step in. Well, I'm going to look at you now. <laughs> One of the, uh, I have a dear friend who's a pastor in uh, Wisconsin, and one of the things that he's done in recent years, I guess he started doing this about 10 years ago, much like your ministry, Bishop Plunder, his, uh, his worship is as much engaged on the street as it is yep. in the building. And he's been an incredible example, you know, for many in doing that. And one of the great, um, one of the great curses of this place is that it can become the idol in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And that's really easy to happen. Mm -hmm. And that we constantly have to push those people who call themselves part of our community out the door. We have to be out the door and in the city. And we've got a long way to go in doing that here at the cathedral. We've got a lot of work to do that we haven't done over the years. But I'm glad to see that there's some of that beginning to take place. Mm -hmm. Glad to see that. And I think that's really important. If we don't, as I said when I first started to arrive, if we don't push ourselves off the top of this hill, then we're just, you know, it's nice and fun, but you're not doing anything. Yeah, yeah it's true. When you tend in a graveyard, mm -hmm. you know, which doesn't make a lot of sense, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Thanks, Michael. And you are, you, and, uh, Bishop Flunder, you said you're tending a graveyard mm -hmm. uh, and you aren't being church. Mm -hmm. And uh, I often say, and people hear me say probably too much, that to call ourselves church is aspirational. Yeah. And uh, that being church is indeed doing in the little pieces of the garden mm -hmm. in which we have been granted to live, uh, uh, doing those things that really affirm the sacredness of everybody yes. that breathes and has breath. And those are in little ways and in big ways. And so for me, my, my dad used to always say, and it's probably what I take with me, he said, the first thing that's important, and he taught all of this, this he said, is just to show up. Yes. And that were, and, and we, taught, we were taught that when we were young, you know, very little, just show up. If you say you're gonna be somewhere, show up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so that as well has stayed with me. And showing up doesn't mean that you always have to do the big thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the small thing that being with someone, showing up, affirming mm -hmm. their humanity when nothing else around them is affirming that humanity, whatever mm -hmm. that may look like. It's not about always being right and not even about knowing what always to do because I don't mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, but it's just being there. And I think that that's important, not simply what we do out there. The Dean talks about going off of the hill, but it's also about what we do in here, mm -hmm. what we do in the buildings that would be church, mm -hmm. right? And so what is it in the buildings that would be church, that grow into being church and allow people to understand that they are being affirmed. If it's in the 
imagery, the icons of the building, do they see themselves? If we believe that everybody's breath is sacred and that everybody shows forth the image of God, do you see that in the building mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, that reflects mm -hmm. that and allows them to affirm that? So it, to me, so there are many answers to the question that you asked, but it starts to me in this matter of showing up. Uh, and then, and I'll leave it here, Again, people have heard me say it, but I think it's what it's about being church, trying to, trying mm -hmm. to be church. And, you know, we have the golden rule, do unto others as we would have them do unto you. But I, and I, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, try to live by the rule of not withholding from another mm -hmm. that which I would not want withheld from myself. Mm. Yeah. And yes, that's food and enough to live by. It's also love, affirmation, being able to grow into whomever it is mm -hmm. God has created me to be. And then going about trying to create the space in the world that doesn't withhold from another that which we would not want withheld from ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is the beginnings of being church. Amen. I think of an, yeah. oh. You know, you make me think about um, a conversation I had with uh, Bishop William Barber not, not very long ago. He came to us uh, at TFAM and sat down with me and said that he wanted, he, he was being consecrated bishop and leader of uh, the Poor People's Campaign and Moral Mondays. Uh, event that most people know what William Barber is doing right now in the world. And he felt de definitively called to it. But he said that um, he's, he's part of the DOC and the AME, and, but he said he wanted to be consecrated bishop at TFAM or by the TFAM leadership. So we like, wow, okay, you know? And we developed uh, the, the sacrament, the, the the service. He came, brought his whole family, his wife, his children, grandchildren, it's just a whole pack of them. And they all came, uh, the people who are part of the campaign. Um, I, we were deeply, felt deeply privileged and deeply humbled because we know the extent of his work among justice for the poor in, in the United States and voting rights. It was huge. But he did something that I think that we need to take a closer look at. And that is the importance of, of cross-pollinating. Because uh, across faith, uh, cross-pollinating ideas, mm -hmm. talking like we're talking right now. Mm -hmm. And had it not been for the pandemic, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. You know, we, you, you never know. We drive past houses all the time. We don't know what people are doing. <laughs> And I've been in places like Chicago, on the south side in particular, where one block, it's like seven or eight churches, some of them share a wall. And this group doesn't think this group is going to heaven. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's amazing to me how different we can be. So he brings his whole family, and we have this, this consecration service for him in elevation, and lay hands on him, my hand first and then the hands of the, the visiting bishops and, and uh, leaders of organizations and denominations, but myself and Bishop Carlton Pearson and different ones of us, Michael Beckwith, we were all there for his consecration. How beautiful was that, right? But why do I think it's beautiful? Because it's the cross-pollination. It's, it's as though the church doesn't have to have glass walls to be what it is that, that I'm talking about. It's a perception. Mm -hmm. Do I have a, yes, do I have a place in there? Is there something there for me? Can I bring my whole self? What do I have to tailor <laughs> to make you want me, you know, to, to make you accept me? He came to us. How, I thought that was big of him because people talked about him because he came to us. But it was the kind of talking about him that he wanted to have talked about him. I feel, I feel that way, even for people who might ask, why am I here? I'm here because I really want to be. 
I really do. I don't do much unless I really want, <laughs> want to do it. But there's something that breaks open in moments like this that suggests that there's a sameness about our humanity, you know. Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, who I have known for a long, long, long time, the connecting tissue for us is her authenticity with me because then that gives me opportunity to have authenticity with her. I don't have to do any pretense, no fake the fuck. Just bring it, you know? How beautiful is that? Imagine that that could happen. And you know church is taking that from us. You know we have to, you know we have to be. Because we, you know, bishops and rectors and doctors, and, you know, and, and agency, you know, department heads and all of that. So there's a way we have to be. Imagine if we didn't have to do that, or we didn't allow that to be a reason why we can't really have cross-pollination. He came to us. We launched that with and for him, and it has touched the whole nation. Mm -hmm. A pack of gay people. I just kind of need to put that. <laughs> Let me just put that out there and say, that's the kind of thing that can bring life and hope and the absence of competition and, and all of those things that happen in, in faith. Can I, can I? Let add me throw quotes? a question yeah. in here and then I wanna, we do, mm -hmm. we're running out of time and this is the one question that came up consistently. Often we do a Q and A during these sessions mm -hmm. and we didn't do that today because we wanted to have as much time with you all as we could, but we did do some prep. Mm -hmm. And the, the question that came up numerous times was we know church is aspirational, right? Mm -hmm. We know that we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. And a number of people said to us, can you ask for wisdom about what you do when you find yourself in a church and then you find out you're not welcome? Mm -hmm. Right? Because we're all in these different places, mm -hmm. right? So how do you know for yourself when to stay mm -hmm. and help affect a change, help build relationship, help do whatever God is calling you to do maybe there? And how do you know when it's time to find another place? And I don't mean that question to necessarily get in the way of the answers and this conversation that we're already having, but I think it's part of it. I think it's part of that conversation is wow. how, do you, how do you discern in that space? And how do we do this cross-pollination, right? Mm -hmm. All of that stuff together. Uh, it's... You know, I read the question ahead of time, but it still feels hard yeah. in the moment as you're asking it. Um, yeah. I, I think in part because my approach has been to leave, right? Mm -hmm. um, as a person of deep faith, with a rich spiritual practice, mm -hmm. um, and, right, like, I mentioned these spaces earlier, right, like, barroom and clubs mm -hmm. and, and bars, mm -hmm. where, like, I, I entered into these spaces, and my friends were like, oh, the pastor's here, like, I am not ordained. I am, mm -hmm. Not a reverend, um, but thank you. Um, where it, it feels like, like I, I have found spaces that feel mm -hmm. like church mm -hmm. because if church is truly community right, in mm -hmm. action towards changing the world and making it into what it ought to be, right? Um, and queer people, I believe, hold that understanding more than anyone because we occupy a particular liminal space in our queerness, right? So we see heaven and earth and we stand in the middle and we're doing this little dance and we're trying to pull heaven into earth. Mm -hmm. by demanding that earth recognize our otherness as holy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for me in particular, there's, it's a push and, push and pull, right? Like some days I'm like, no, this is, this is my house. Mm -hmm. My Bible said this is my daddy's house and I'm, this is mine. <laughs> um, also, I don't want to go home. Um, I'm on an extended leave. I'm, I, I will visit on Christmas, right? Like that's just where I'm at, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I think... I reached, a, I reached a point where there was a limit to what I could do within the walls of the church, mm -hmm. um, but as a theologian that works in religious spaces and interacts with religious leaders around the country on the daily, right, and not like a, look at me go, I'm like, this is weird, right, like, I'm this queer kid that's not allowed in many ways, like, to enter these pulpits and stand, right, like, on the floor, in the pulpit, like, you know, mm -hmm. there's, and yet I interact with these folks on a daily basis and I make demands of them. I, I, I engage in really fascinating conversations with them in hopes that like those who are still devoted to staying 
or unsure how to leave might find themselves in a better environment mm -hmm. the next morning they wake up mm -hmm. um, and they go to church or they go to Shabbat service, right? Like wh wherever they're worshiping, that they might find hope. Yes. But I am not personally committed to, particularly within the scope of Christianity, a lot, and I'm sorry, I'm a fan, a couple people mm -hmm. at least, most of these institutions, most of these, these denominations are rooted in an anti-black capitalist, anti-queer structure. Mm -hmm. I'm not devoted to upholding that. My work in the world, as I feel called by God, mm -hmm. is to dismantle those very yep. things and build something new. Jesus yeah. said, all, the temple's gonna, it's, it's all coming down, Peter. You, the building's cute, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. Peter rolled up in Jerusalem, was like, mm -hmm. Jesus, look at all the pretty buildings. Jesus, I don't, I don't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all coming down mm -hmm. because what matters truly is the liberation of all people, right? The, the abundance that is available, yes, right? right? The, the freedom that is available, the wholeness and the health that is available to all. And these structures, for the majority of their existence, but let's just say the last 500 years have been devoted to the opposite of that, mm -hmm. right? That's a good I, I can't devote myself. We, I mean, there are folks, and I, I understand why folks remain, mm -hmm. uh, but we cannot, commit ourselves wholly to the upholding of mm -hmm. a system that is unwilling to change. Mm -hmm. oh, that's good. We have to be the change. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Dean Douglas, do you want to wrap this up? You look like you're yeah, well, no, I'm, what I was mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> listening and uh, learning from the wisdom. Of, of today and learning from uh, the wisdom of uh, someone that I am um, humbled to call friend, uh, Bishop Flanders. And I'll answer your question, but I want to tag on one thing that uh, she said earlier. And um, yeah, we've known each other for years. And one of the spaces in which we met, and this is something about showing up in something about her was a space several, I don't know when it was now, when all the propositions were going before various city and state mm -hmm. governments uh, that were uh, de denying the humanity of uh, same gendered loving people. And uh, we were a part of a group of black clergy mm -hmm that were trying to change the narrative underground, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because many people in that group of which we were part did not want people to know they were part of that group. And, right. and, and there were strong, passionate discussions in the group of whether or not you were going to let people know you were part of that group. Uh, the point I'm making is that some of the work that is work to be done isn't work in which you were going to uh, get all the limelight and be out there. And one of the things that I knew about Bishop Flunders and, and others as well as Bishop Barber, that they were doing this work long before people knew their name. Yep. And that's what it means <laughs> to be church. Mm -hmm. uh, to no one has to know your name, you just yep. do the work and plant the little seed and doing, I remember in that time, we didn't know what was gonna come of that work, uh, to, but just keep doing it and plant the little seed and, and Bishop Flunders was doing that uh, and pulls people like me along. I learn uh, from people like her that do that work. Uh, your question was how do you stay in a church that, that, that hurt you or in, in these spaces that hurt you. Well, you know, for me on the sort of congregational level, I mean, I don't think of our wider Episcopal Church. It took me a long time to realize that the Episcopal Church was white because I always went to a black church, black <laughs> congregation, right? So when I got older, and, uh, and in mm -hmm. fact, I remember one time at a convention sitting next to a Bishop Buddy saying, 
Mm -hmm. Dang, this church is white. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I said my mom. Right, my, 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 right? So it took a long time to figure out. I was like, what are these white people doing in my church? Right. But, uh, <laughs> like the UCC. So, <laughs> right, right? Spirit. So it took right. me a long time, I tell win. you. But, uh, so, so it was usually, you know, in my black church spaces, oh, but because of who I was yes, as a yes. woman and because I yes. just never fulfilled yes. uh, sort of the uh, gender constructions of what mm -hmm. you, you know, play with dolls and all that stuff. I never did that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so it was usually in black spaces where uh, mm -hmm. I was made to feel uh, not wanted. And mm -hmm. here's what I've uh, learned in those spaces. And in places, I've been invited places mm -hmm. uh, to, to preach, not in Episcopal mm -hmm. places, as I said before. And then I get there and it's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> you you can't preach here, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, and and that's happened on several occasions. And what I've learned two things: that when I'm in spaces hmm. that hurt more than they bring healing and love mm -hmm. to others, then it's time to leave. When there's not that or in places mm -hmm. where make me feel worse about myself than I did before I went in, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, then it's, it's time to leave. And that's what I tell and Nobody deserves to mm -hmm. be in an abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tell mm -hmm. my siblings, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, you don't deserve to be in an abusive relationship, right. and especially not in a place that calls itself church. Mm -hmm. Then that's right. the, other things like, so why do you stay in those places and preach anyhow? And when they make you preach, one time they made me preach, this is a true story, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Once they made me preach from the back in the, in the, in the balcony, like in the back of the yeah. church, right, mm -hmm. right, church down south, mm -hmm. I won't call its name, uh, made me preach. The only reason I stayed and did it, because otherwise I would have said, really? Mm -hmm. uh, they already paying me that much. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, real, but the women in that church begged yeah. me to stay. Yeah. 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 And, you know, begged me to stay. And so I preached for them, changed my sermon, uh, to, but, but preached, preached for them. And so, that, so those are, I don't know what that's, you know, try to be in places that will help others who were there. And, uh, and I'm only there for a moment, and uh, encourage people not to stay in places that uh, abuse them, and I try not, to, try not to do that. This is amazing, y'all. We are over time. I, ha I have the terrible job of saying <laughs> we, we need to pause this conversation. I hope truly that the conversation will continue amongst us, that we can continue to cross-pollinate and stay connected either through this space or through the many spaces where we can be connected. So, um, and Bishop Flunder, we're so grateful for oh, you coming to be with us today. Yes. My joy. Thank you. You so really blessed us. Joy. Yeah, blessings uh, from all three of you and from your sermon earlier. And oh, you, would you pray us out? Oh, I'd be happy to. Are we prepared? I'm ready. <laughs> all right. Gracious God, by all of your many names in all of your beautiful and magnificent manifestations, we bless you for the opportunity to be kindred we bless you for allowing us to connect spirit to spirit, destiny to destiny, call to call. For those who are with us in this gathering physically and virtually, we declare this to be the house of God, the dwelling place. Because we are your people and because you dwell in and through us, we ask your favor in this peculiar time in which we live. Help us to learn something about being change agents from the inside and outside. Help us, oh God, to be clear, order our steps, place our feet firmly where you would have us go. And when we get there, help us to have the divine preparation and courage that is needed in the time in which we live. We pray for those who are suffering the losses associated with COVID-19. We pray for our nation, 
We pray, O oh God, for healing for what we call religion. Would you transform it, God, into relationship? We pray, O oh God, for these great churches and faith-based organizations and faith paths and faith responsibilities that are with us physically and who are with us virtually. Bless our nation and world and let us emerge from this perfect storm of issues to being a better world, a better society, a better church, a better family. And finally, we lift up the young people and the generations coming after us. And we pray that they won't find a need to repeat some of our realities just in another style and in another way. Help them to manage power. Help them to manage money. Help them to manage relationships and connections. Help them to speak truth to power, both in the world and to the man or woman in the mirror. Bless, O oh God, until justice really does run down like water, hallelujah, and righteousness like a mighty stream. We call these things into existence, perhaps that are not as though they are, and we declare it in the name of Jesus and in the name of all that is pure and right and just and holy and divine. And we say, Amen, Ashe, and so it is. God bless you today. Amen. Thank you. God bless you today. Thank you, and thank all of you for being with us today. Amen. Amen.